point, here's our, here's our 3D projection. Here is your capital R hat. There's your capital R hat. Theta hat is going to be parallel to the xy plane. Let's see, how am I going to do this? I've got to show you this. Here's the capital R with the R hat pointing in the direction of the eraser. Theta hat has to be parallel to the xy plane. So it has to be in the xy plane, like the eraser here. And it comes up and it has to be mutually perpendicular to this capital R hat vector. So it has to sit there like this, paralleling, paralleling the xy plane down below us, like the floor. Okay? And then there has to be a phi hat for that third dimension, r hat, big R theta, and now phi. So what would you expect for that direction? So perpendicular to both of them, kind of back toward you? Yes, mutually perpendicular. So we're going to have a triad of three. You can use your thumb, index finger, and middle finger to form it with your right hand very nicely. So this will actually work a little better maybe to see it. I have the big R hat here. I have the theta hat here, perpendicular to this, both of these, and then pointing back up out of a plane formed by big R and theta hat is the phi hat. <sighs> now, I'll put you to sleep if I keep talking, but <laughs> if, <laughs> okay. Well, a couple of you I might not put to sleep, but the rest of you I would. Okay. <laughs> if I start cranking the derivatives here, look at this. You're going to get a big R dot. That's your telescoping effect, right? Big R dot. This, right? Times the R hat. Okay, so it's staying that way. And then we have a time derivative of this thing. Now, that's pretty wild. The time derivative of that has more than one component. Because think about the motion. Think about the motion. This thing can be moving radially in or out. That's your R dot, big R dot. And at the same time, the particle's moving like my fist. It can be going this way, radially out and going in, in, rota in theta rotation. And at the same time, it can be going in feed rotation. Okay. So that's why they don't show you the derivation <laughs> of this stuff in the book. <laughs> but it's, you just crank, you can just step your way through the math, but you've got to have a physical sense of it to be able to uh, sort of have, be able to capture that in your head. So you get down to the velocity of that particle. <laughs> and so it's going to have a V sub capital R term in the capital R hat direction it's going to have a v sub theta term in a theta hat direction, and it's going to have a v sub phi term in the phi hat direction. That should make sense to you that there are three components possible on that velocity. Three components on that velocity. The resultant of those <coughs> The resultant of those is going to be the speed. Well, actually, the resultant would be the vector. But the magnitude of that vector is going to be the speed made up of these three components, square root of the sum of the squares of those terms. Okay. Plus theta hat is all theta hat prime. Say that again. Phi hat yeah. plus theta hat equals all theta hat prime. Correct? No. And then how would the vectors add up? Okay. Nice. It's half.
has to do with, in, in here, as you start working up the derivative, you've got to work that thing up. And that thing's got more than, that has a couple of different components. And you have to go back to that, that, uh, that process where we had a differential rotation. You have a differential rotation in theta now, and you also have a differential rotation in phi occurring that give rise to this thing. So there's components that then are created by this that point in this direction, the theta hat and the phi hat direction. Okay, let me show you in the book. Just in summary, here are the polar, or the cylindrical forms that we developed earlier. Those are pretty straightforward. And let me look at the, let me show you the sphericals here. Here they are. So the first one was no problem. Capital R dot in the unit vector R, capital R hat direction. Here is, appears to be kind of like your polar term, r theta dot, but you have to account for that phi business going on, and without explanation, we're just giving it to you here, cosine phi, and that's this middle term with its unit vector. And then finally, the phi-directed component of velocity is similar to your polar. It's pretty straightforward. It's just this guy. Let me uh, I'll wait till the camera gets back on me here. It's this guy right here where my uh, where the marker is pointing. It's that speed component. And that should make sense to you. The radius and the rotational rate of phi, phi dot. Okay. Yes. We can get that. The uh, theta velocity because r cosine of phi is equal to the little r. Yes, r co and that's where that comes from. So the derivation on that's actually not too bad in the understanding of the physical details. I just didn't want to take too much time on it. Now, it gets more interesting. Look at this. You've got time depend two time dependent terms on your r term here, your capital R term. Two time dependent terms that are required in the derivative to get the up the work up the acceleration. You've got three time-dependent terms on the theta plus the unit vector, which changes direction with time. So there's four terms involved in the derivative there. And then on this phi term, there's two here plus your phi hat. So there's three terms there. When you crank the derivatives now, you to work up your acceleration. It's crazy. Here's where it gets to. And notice. The expansion of the theta and phi terms on the acceleration, they leave them in terms of the time derivative there. And what I'd like to do is to just pencil that out for you on the board here so that you feel comfortable uh, if you decide to use those like in a homework problem. <laughs> okay? So let's look at the a theta term and expand it out a bit. We have uh, cosine of phi over capital R. And then we want to take the time derivative of r squared theta dot. The time derivative of r squared theta dot is 2r r dot theta dot plus r squared theta double dot. And then we have to subtract that last term, minus 2r theta dot phi dot sine of phi. If you want to pencil that in your book, you can. I just didn't want you to screw up the r squared theta dot <laughs> expression's derivative there. you got to use your chain rule on it. Okay. On the phi-directed term on the acceleration, 
it's given as 1 over capital R times the time derivative of R squared phi dot, same kind of a deal, 2R R dot phi dot plus R squared phi double dot. And then we have to add that last term in plus R theta dot squared sine, is it phi or theta? Sine phi cos phi. Sine phi Sometimes you will see books where this term is written differently. And I just want to do a quick review with you. Something, there's a couple things in trigonometry that sometimes slip through the cracks that you should remember because they show up all the time in engineering and when you're working problems or particularly taking exams and you're try under time pressure on an exam, you want to try to be pretty automatic on some of that. So let me just do a quick review with you of one item here. If you had the sum of two angles and you wanted the sign of the sum of the two angles, you should remember this trig sum formula. This is equal to the sine of one angle times the cosine of the other plus the opposite combination. Cosine of alpha, sine of phi, uh, beta, sorry. Okay, so this is one that I would highly recommend that you think about remembering. And then if both angles are the same, both angles are the same, like in other words, you're doubling an angle, then you might think of it as a sine of twice an angle, and then you'd have the product of sine and, sine and cosine of x and cosine of sine and x, and that's just two of those terms. reason I wanted to review this is because there are many expressions similar to what you see up here where you see a product of a sine and cosine. That frequently is treated as the sine of twice the angle over 2. Frequently. So that could easily be a replacement. You could have the sine of, of twice phi right there. over 2 for that term right there. Okay. All right. So we have time to, we have time, I think, to do a problem. I would highly recommend that you study these examples in this section, such as a problem like this. This is an example that's worked out in detail. And I want to point out something to you that would be useful. Somebody, let me borrow a pencil for just a second. What they're doing in this particular example is they're using, you can see what they're using here. They got theta and phi and capital R, and they're, so they're using spherical coordinates in this example. <coughs> and what you want to do if you have something like this, this is an airplane taking off, lift off, and then heading in a straight line, uh, speeding up, I believe, as it goes from some initial velocity, it speeds up as it travels a distance here. And so then the question is, what's going on relative to this radar that's monitoring the plane? So what I wanted to point out to you is it's very important for you to think about decomposing that velocity into a, let me extend that velocity a little bit, into a term that is 
like this. I don't know if you can see that. What, what I'm trying to draw there is this bottom line is parallel, is parallel to this xy plane. It's parallel to the xy plane. And then perpendicular Oh, did I do that right? Yes. And then the other term I wanted, let me, th let me think about that for a second. Actually, they do the problem both ways here. If I was going to do this, the reason I was pausing for a second is because I'm, I'm looking at the, their first development in their solution is in polar, and they're cylindrical, and then their second solution they do is in spherical. So that's why I wanted you to study this, is if I make a perpendicular to the capital R, like I was just talking about with a spherical, and I come down off that velocity vector, perpendicular to the capital R, or I'm sorry, um, what, I, what I'm trying to do is to get, I'm just going to erase that, what I need to get is a component of this speed that is in these, that is in the direction of this capital R coming out this way, and then I need one that is perpendicular to the capital R which is a phi-directed term. And then I also need a theta-directed term there. So you've got to be very careful on how you, how you break the given um, motion down. Is this the picture of Jordan and Ethan? Yeah, they've got two of them. Down. They have two of them here. If you take a top view looking down on this image, you'll see this picture. This is a top view looking down right here. And then with some self-study, which we don't have time to spend on it right now, is you can take this picture down here and use it to help you resolve this into your capital R-directed term, your phi-directed term, and there should be another term here. I'm not seeing it. No, theta-directed term. But here's the phi-directed term. There's the capital R-directed term. So anyway, we'll have to spend a little more time on that or do a little self-study on that if you could. OK, we have just a few minutes left. So what I'd like to do is to come over to a problem here in the book. Let's look at this ride. I wrote down answers already. You can imagine a, this is a helix path followed by this amusement car ride. And what's going on as the car passes point A, it is physically moving forward down this cylinder at a tilt angle of 40 degrees at an angle of 40 degrees. So it's moving down the cylinder at a constant angle of 40 degrees as you project down the cylinder. They tell us that the velocity of the cars as they pass position A is 15 meters per second. 15 meters per second. Along the line of the path. Along the line of the path. That's a good, good observation. Along the line of the path. And then they help us a little bit. They say the component of their acceleration measured along the tangent to the path happens to be involving gravity, g cosine of that helix angle, phi, or gamma, excuse me. The effective radius of the helix is 5 meters, and the helix angle is 40 degrees. 
compute the magnitude of the acceleration of the passengers as they pass that position. Just pencil. So, if I would look down the back end of the cylinder and the car's spiraling down, heading into the board, right? Okay. Then the vehicle happens to be right here. The car happens to be right there at point A at the instant in question. And this is on a effective five meter radius, I believe they said, okay? And they told us the velocity was what? 15 meters, 15, 15 meters, 15 meters, 15 meters per second. Yeah. Does that mean, as it's spiraling down here, is it 15 meters downward here? No, no, but that's Okay, so there is a term heading this direction. So if I look at it now sideways, if I look at the cylinder sideways here, it's at this location, but it is tilted at 40 degrees forward. And there's the 15, you said 15? Yes. 15 meters per second. And so that means the component downward is going to be 15 cosine of 40 degrees. And that's what's going down here. Why do I want that? Because the question is asking us about acceleration. That's your uh, B for your circular path. Yes, that's, that's the circular type of thing, okay? And so that means there's an acceleration term pointing which way? Back in here, which is going to be that speed squared over that effective radius of curvature. Now in their picture, they show that as five meters and in the wording of the question, they say that the radius of the cylindrical helix is five meters, okay. So we're gonna use that 15 cosine 40 degrees quantity squared over that five to get that component of acceleration. What's, and they also told us that the component what did they tell us about acceleration then? G cosine gamma. How long the component tangent to the path? Is which component? What's it say in the word? Tangent there? to the path. Tangent to the path. So again, if I'm now looking at the acceleration term, tangent to the path, they're telling me that this is G cosine of our 40 degrees. Tangent to the path, okay? Which is what I've drawn right there, okay? <coughs> So then we have two components of acceleration here. We have a G cosine of 40 times the sine of 40 is a component of acceleration. See, that's this piece. This is what they gave us here. And so we need the sine of 40 to get the acceleration experience down the, down the cylinder, down the cylinder. And then we need to take the G cosine 40, which is this, times cosine 40 again to get the acceleration this way. G cosine squared of 40 degrees. So our acceleration is made up of one that's back towards the axis of, axis of the motion, and then one that is straight downward and one that is straight down the cylinder's axis. Those three are orthogonal, aren't they? Yeah. All three of them are orthogonal. And that makes up a complete description of the acceleration. So if you punch this on your calculator, one term should be this, 
and I wrote the answers down here, I believe. I think that should be negative 26.41. Does this punch out? Anybody punch it? Anybody got to have their calculator out? Okay. There's one. Fifteen cos forty quantity squared divided by five. Twenty six point four. Okay, and it points back towards the axis, so I call it negative. Okay, and then if we take the other acceleration, if we take uh, g, now we have to use nine point eight one here times the cosine squared of forty degrees. We should get the uh, that's going to be our theta directed term. And that term should come out to be this 5.76, I think that says. Meters per second squared. There's that one. And then this is the z directed term right here. This is the az term. And the notes indicate my answer, if that checks out, should be 4.83. Okay. So that was a using the cylindrical coordinates where we were defined as R. R is radially, R hat. Theta hat is this way. And then Z is down the, down the cylinder. R hat, theta hat, Z hat down the cylinder. Okay, that does it for today. What we'll do tomorrow is we'll carry on with uh, answering questions about these uh, this uh, three-dimensional type space motion, and then we'll start looking at some uh, the next topic, which I believe is constrained motion.